Hi, this is Elliot Fishman. Welcome back to part two of the acute abdomen GI applications. We were speaking about small bowel obstruction before. I showed you a few excellent cases. And just to reinforce, closed loop obstruction, that's one of the critical things. Uh, you can miss it. If you do miss it, the patient can die. Most commonly is caused by adhesive bands, but also internal hernias or external hernias. The closed loop obstruction can lead to a volvulus, which can lead to impairment of venous outflow, followed by arterial ischemia. The classic appearance is C or U-shaped distended loops with the mesenteric vessels converging toward the site of obstruction. It's usually easy to see on CT if you're careful, but particularly well seen on the coronal or 3D images. Article by Paulson, the finding of a closed loop obstruction depends in part on the orientation of the loop relative to the plane. If it's within the plane of imaging, it's a U or C or coffee bean configuration. Now, some of that depends on how well you do the reconstructions. Here was a patient with obstruction distal small bowel. Now, the one thing you notice is the patient has a feces sign, so you know there's something going on. Then you look at it a little bit closer dilated loops, you see trace societies. Trace societies always bothers me. I'm worried about ischemia of the bowel loop. And there it is. But then look at the coronal. Look at that classic, you know, C or U upside down configuration. You see that configuration of the U. You see the feces sign. You see the transition. This was due to adhesions in this patient who had history of abdominal pain. And here's a beautiful schematic showing you exactly how the coffee bean looks and how you do have the dilated proximal and the decompressed distal bowel. And here's just a very classic appearance of that loop in this example. And here's a couple more views in the uh, 3D volume rendered images. So again, very, very important to recognize this. You can see from the axials, you knew something was going on, but it's that closed loop obstruction that takes the patient directly to surgery shown nicely on the coronal or 3D coronal. In this example, you see the bowel loops are dilated. There are more bowel loops left up a quadrant. But you also see for a wonderful injection, the loops are not enhancing very well. And then when you go down to the patient's imaging, we'll look a little bit closer. Look at, um, look at the, on the video. As we scroll down, you can see very nicely those dilated loops. They're sitting in the lesser sac. You don't have bowel loops in the lesser sac. You watch this nodes present. And you see you're scrolling. So you know there is this obstruction. You know what's going on. And we come back up a bit. But you kind of wonder a little bit more of the detail. You know there has to be this internal hernia. So then you look and you say, well, let's look at the coronal view. Well, in the coronal view, you can see very nicely, as we track from front to back, the dilated loops not really enhancing well in the lesser sac. And you begin to see the stretching of the mesenteric vessels. And if you come back, you can see that what it looks like is you have a twist and everything is rotated and points up to the left upper quadrant. And this is an internal hernia with volvulus into the lesser sac. And look at the engorged mesenteric vessels. And so when you then finally do one last set of images where you look at the sagittal view, and again, the importance of interactive imaging, you again see very nicely lesser sac with the dilated loops of bowel, the prominent mesenteric vessels, the engorged mesentery, the engorged mesenteric vessels, and this patient with an internal hernia. And here's just two of the best images, but you have to admit the one image that's best is that coronal with the dilated loop of bowel and the real thickening and inflammation of the bowel present. And there it is with volume rendering and MIP. Just beautiful examples of the 3D map. And again, it's important to be able to recognize these findings so you make a rapid and early diagnosis. This patient needs to go directly to surgery. The patient diddles, twiddles around, or diddles around, whatever you want to call it, this patient could die. And here's just a few more pictures of that. When we look at bowel obstruction, we follow it down, dilated bowel, and you follow it down, the patient has a right inguinal hernia, and bowel goes into the hernia. So we look for hernias as well. Hernias could be inguinal hernias. It could be sites of prior trocars, prior operations. But again, look how nicely you see the hernia. And within the hernia, I see the transition of the bowel. But also, I see some fluid, which tells me, since there's no fluid anywhere else, this patient, we're dealing with ischemic bowel. Just a very nice example.
External hernias are the second most frequent cause of bowel obstruction. They can occur anywhere. The hallmark of bowel obstruction due to hernia is the presence of a dilated bowel loop to the hernia sac, followed by decompressed bowel exiting from the sac. So again, a very classic appearance. When you see bowel loops going beyond the abdominal wall, sometimes it's a patchless hernia, sometimes you see it by an ostomy, but when you see it through a tight opening and you see it's coming in not dilated and it's dilated within that hernia, you know you're dealing with entrapped bowel. Nothing very tricky. Now when we look at bowel obstruction, sometimes we make a diagnosis that was unsuspected. This patient has dilated bowel, but there's a transition at the ligament of trites by an unsuspected pancreatic cancer nicely seen in this example. And again, you see the mass is obstructing bowel, but it's not a small bowel tumor. It's not a retroperitoneal tumor per se. It's a tumor of the patient's pancreatic tail, which is causing obstruction. So things, third portion, fourth portion of duodenum and the proximal jejunum can all be involved by, by tumor. And tumor from the pancreas is a common sort. Now, we also speak about, and we've talked about CT enterography, talking about the signs of mucosal enhancement, wall thickening, mural stratification, mesenteric fat thickening. And it's important to recognize those signs because it's one of the common things, particularly in younger patients, for, for uh, abdominal pain or the acute abdomen. You want to be able to recognize unsuspected Crohn's disease and in patients with unsuspected or suspected Crohn's disease, you want to be able to pick up the complications ranging from abscess to liver issues to problems involving multiple organs. Now you can see in this case, in this patient with Crohn's, the prominent vessels to the right lower quadrant, the so-called prominent vasorecta, seen very nicely on the MIP imaging of the right colon, and that's something um, Again, in terms of vasculature, you're going to see, uh, in terms of recognizing specific pathology, looking at the activity of pathology. So it's very important to be able to look at the MIP imaging. In this case of Crohn's dilated bowel, and there's an enterolith present, which looks like a saucer on the coronal view. So we're seeing the diseased bowel. We're also seeing the transition, which is right here. This patient had surgery. That transition was negative. And again, you can see here the fiber fatty proliferation, the mesentery, the thick and small bowel loop, which tracks to the left of midline. Again, the importance of the extension of tumor cannot be over or inflammatory disease is something CT is very good about, defining the full extent, giving you all the information, and then managing the patient accordingly. Here's an example of a Crohn's patient, but the patient has a right psoas abscess. Abscesses commonly have peripheral enhancement, Crohn's, often involves psoas, or really a psoas muscle, very nicely shown in this example. CT enterography has been shown to be more cost effective in the long-term assessment and follow-up patients, especially with those with established Crohn's disease. So this is from one of the articles published in Radiographics a couple years back. And the European Crohn's and Colitis Organization defined CT enterography as the imaging technique with the highest accuracy for detection of intestinal involvement and assessment of inflammatory activity. CTE has been shown to be 80% or more sensitive and specific for detecting small bowel segments affected by Crohn's. And again, they emphasize the multiplanar nature of CT. And in two studies compared with ileostomy, sensitivity 92%, specificity 100% for diagnosing uh, inflammation. So again, you could see um, that CT enterography is very competitive. Now, when we talk about CT enterography, we also I like to talk and mention about vessels. I mean, one of the things with dual energy CT, but just fast CT scanning, has our ability to make every patient into a CT angiogram almost. So SMA syndrome, classic, total body casting, but now anorexia, classically seen with total body weight loss. Behind the uh, SMA goes the uh, patient's duodenum and the left renal vein. And so what happens is you can get compression of the vein, so-called nutcracker syndrome. You can get compression of the duodenum. can cause obstruction. Typically, the SMA angle is 45 degrees, while in SMA syndrome, it's usually in the 10 degree range. And the SMA to aorta distance goes from 10 to 20 millimeters to under eight. An example, dilated stomach, dilated duodenum, 
The patient was anorexic. This is a male patient. Now you see as its SMA comes across, it's going through the uh, zone between the aorta and the SMA, and it's markedly narrowed, and you can see it's obstructed. When you look at the coronal view, this is a classic example of SMA syndrome with obstruction. Now you can have, and I should mention, the SMA angle narrowed and no problem. SMA narrowing does occur, but to me, to make it SMA syndrome, you need to see duodenal obstruction. So if I read a scan and I see SMA angle narrowing, I'll comment on that, but unless I see the duodenum being dilated, I'm not going to call it SMA syndrome, and that becomes very important. And in this case, there's a cutoff at the SMA, and there very nicely is the marked narrowing of the SMA angle. So you can see that very well in this study. And in this example, again, dilated duodenum, and you can see the SMA. You see the transition of the SMA and the dilated loop of bowel. Very nicely shown, classic SMA obstruction. And here it is showing you the dilated loop and showing you that angle that is so decreased and the distance that also so decreased. So when you have it like this, it's very easy to make a very specific diagnosis. Here's another example. Again, look how big the duodenum is right to where the SMA crossing is. You can see the narrowed angle, and there it is when you do the reconstructions. So it becomes very, very important to really understand changes in bowel, changes in vessels, dilatation, obstruction, areas of narrowing. It's important to look at all of that, and it's important to also you can see why you need to go beyond just simply looking at the patient's axial imaging. You're not going to see the obstruction without looking at the coronal and sagittal views, which very nicely is shown in this case. Now, what else could I put under the acute abdomen? Well, I can't put GI bleeding. GI bleeding is one of the things where CT is very, very strong and is being used more and more often. We classify GI bleeding as upper and lower GI bleeding, with the transition being the ligament of trites. Distal to the ligament of trites, 30% of cases of GI bleed. Proximal ligament of trites, 70%. Most patients who have upper GI bleeding, so-called proximal to ligament of trites, what you're thinking there is doing endoscopy. But you can see CT can be very good. Blood in the stomach, ascites, there's a bright blush in the patient's image on your right in the stomach. So there it is when it's circled. And you can see when you go on the left from arterial to venous phase, that side of bleeding becomes more active. Remember, we, we'll talk, and we've spoken before on GI bleeding, and I mentioned we do dual phase imaging because often the venous phase is very helpful, and it may be the only phase to show the bleed, or in this case, making the bleed indeed more impressive. And there it is in the coronal view. We really get that nice jet of blood. You also see the high density in the stomach, a good secondary sign that the patient had GI bleeding. Or in this case, it looks like contrast in the duodenum. There is no contrast. The patient wasn't given contrast. Here's the MIP imaging. And what you can see from this imaging is a very bright duodenum. The patient had a bleed in the second portion of duodenum. And what you're looking at in these images is active bleed in the patient's duodenum. And that bleed is simulating actually what looks like oral contrast. That's how brisk the bleed was. So again, it could be a pitfall. If you see what it looks like to do a denim, I mean, sometimes patients get oral contrast. Sometimes they take certain medications like Maalox that can fool you. But you need to be very, very careful. And the change between the two phases is helpful. If it was just contrast, it would not change in appearance between the two phases. Now, when you look at CT enterography, we talk about causes of bleeding and angiodysplasia is number one. Though you can see from the list, there are a range of causes. The history of GI bleeding and CT began people like Yoon when we had a 16 slice. Arterial phase is great for looking at bleeding sites and localization of massive bleeds. In that article, they were 100% accurate for localizing, but in great part, they were looking at massive bleeds. As things got better, we recognized that this could be seen in essentially any patient who has GI bleeding. And so with the better scanners, you can get very thin sections. You can look for changes. Over time, you could detect the presence of GI bleeding very well. And this article by Steiner, again, talking about multiplanar, talking about how CT is critical for angiography. If you're worrying about bleeding and the CT is negative, angiography should probably not be done.
Now, one of the good things about CT is, besides showing where the bleeding is, it shows the site and it shows what vessel. So often you can have a patient who gets an angiogram, a CT angiogram that is, and it's obviously positive and two hours later when the angio happens is negative. In those cases, what the, uh, in the, what the uh, interventionalist can do is go in and inject the vessel that they know from the arterial phase CT is causing the problems. So again, very, very important, the fact that CT is better than DSA for picking up small bleeds. And you can see causes. In this case, you see high density in the duodenum. At first point, you scratch your head, what could this be? You look at it a coronal and there are multiple bright dots. You look at it again with MIP and now you see the multiple bright dots and you realize how many bright dots there are. You realize we're talking about angiodysplasia and you realize that this patient uh, cause of GI bleeding was angiodysplasia. Just an absolutely beautiful example. This case shows you also why the MIP is so important. On the coronal, you just don't see much, but on the MIP, look how obvious it is present. Uh, other things in GI bleeding, we could talk about GIST tumors. Uh, GIST tumors are often larger tumors, but they can occur in the small bowel and be smaller. And those are the ones that are very bright on CT, but also very vascular and cause GI bleeding. You see a very nice exophytic lesion here, which was a small GIST tumor, which had caused bleeding. Or in this case, vascular lesion, there's some desmoplastic reaction. I wondered about a carcinoid tumor. This ended up being a GIST tumor. Sometimes you can't tell carcinoids from GIST. But a very, very important um, process. Look how beautiful you can see that bright blood. Again, in terms of bleeding, there are many causes. Here's an example of an ileal diverticulum that bled. Notice it's changed between the phases, as I'll show you the images. Or in this example, this patient has um, a scope. They actually put a capsule in this patient. The capsule is giving artifact. It eventually was obstructed. Eventually it was negative. But look at CT. There's a tubular structure in the left lower quadrant, which we circle here. Think about for a second, what is that? Could be the appendix, but when you start looking at location, you see the appendix. And when you look at this, you realize that it's coming off the colon and you realize it's a um, very, very classic finding. It's a Meckel's diverticulum. And when you look at the next set of images, you can see how bright it is. Meckel's are often very bright. They can bleed, but they're also very vascular lesions. And here it is when you do a nuclear medicine study. So Meckel's is uncommon. It's a cause of GI bleeding more common in younger patients, but it can be tricky, and we've seen it, and we published an article on it, so you want to be indeed be very careful. Now, we also have bleeds that are due to colon cancer. And uh, there were just a number of uh, other possibilities in terms of GI bleeding. There are some real tricks we do when we look at GI bleeding in the colon. And so what I think I'll do is time is getting late. Let's just take a five minute break and we'll come back and we'll pick it off with that discussion. Thanks a lot.